Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is Clayton Allen, U.S. Director at Eurasia Group. Clayton, thank you so much for joining me. For having me. All eyes were on the United States this week watching the presidential election. And in a stunning reversal, Donald Trump won the White House after losing back in 2020. So I want to talk about the foreign policy implications here and what this means for the rest of the world. So when our allies and our adversaries see that Donald Trump at the beginning of next year will be back in the White House, what are they thinking? I think that there's a a combination. Uh, I think if you're Europe, you're thinking about this as potentially reducing the U.S.'s footprint, the U.S.'s assistance that's likely to come, the U.S. support for European security. I think if you're Russia or China, you're looking at this and saying this resets potentially our expectations. For China, probably more of a focus on aggressive U.S. trade policy, less reliance, less focus on rebuilding some of the diplomatic guardrails that Biden uh, spent the last year and a half really trying to erect. If you're Russia, this maybe changes the dynamic with regard to Ukraine. The U.S. will be playing less of an active role, and you'll have a U.S. leader who's more explicitly interested in bringing the conflict to a close. I think when you look to the Middle East, uh, Iran certainly did not prefer Trump to win. They look at him as maybe a larger threat uh, from two directions. One, in terms of sanctions policy. You know, his decision to appoint Brian Hook as the head of his State Department transition. Hook, of course, was the special representative, special envoy for Iran, during the period of maximum pressure in Trump's first administration, suggests that sanctions are certainly back on the table as Trump looks for options to contain the Iranian regime. Similarly, Trump's going to be much less restrictive, uh, much less critical of Israel's policies, Israel's military planning. So Israeli uh, military action seems like it's going to face less U.S. pushback. I think it's really kind of what you think about Trump depends on where you sit, but it's largely a picture of less of a U.S. footprint, less of a U.S. interventionist role. To your point, Donald Trump has really campaigned on this America first mentality. So when you, if you're our ally, maybe in Europe, Canada, perhaps, and you know this, what does that do to our relationships long term when he has this more isolationist approach? Yeah, it certainly reduces the U.S.'s leverage, it reduces the U.S.'s influence. Uh, the U.S. right now is effectively a political hegemon within Europe because the U.S. provides for European security. If that's no longer the case, The U.S.'s ability to influence European decision-making, European policy directions, far less. When it comes to Canada, the question might be a little bit different. Uh, Canada is obviously the U.S.'s closest ally geographically and probably politically. shares the world's largest uncontested border with the U.S. It's part of the U.S.'s air defense network. Where you might see this impacting uh, U.S.-Canadian relationships is not on the foundational, the the obvious, the very clearly defined aspects of the relationship, but maybe on that soft power aspect, the willingness of the U.S. to share intelligence information, to cooperate above and beyond what might be expected, that could be reduced as Trump looks at Canada maybe more as a freeloader, uh, looking at Canada as underperforming its defense spending commitments. These are all things that I think if you're a U.S. ally that currently depends on the U.S. for guarantee of your own security, you're kind of questioning what that looks like in six months, a year or two years. There are multiple wars spanning multiple continents as we sit here right now, and I want to talk about them. Let's first go to the war in Ukraine. Donald Trump said before that if he was president, he could end the war in a day. First, I mean, realistically, how likely that is, and what does that mean for both Russia and Ukraine? So he said he could end it in a day. He didn't say when that day would come. Uh, I think that's an important distinction. We don't think Trump has the leverage to force ceasefire negotiations in the immediate future. Uh, certainly, you would see Trump take a different approach than Biden. Biden's approach has been predicated entirely on extreme political deference to Kiev. Negotiations around a ceasefire would only take place when Kiev was comfortable with them. With Trump, there's less def- deference to Kiev. There's also less uh, reliance or less interest in coordinating whatever that end game, uh, the end game of the conflict looks like with European allies. I think Trump would approach this as well. I can negotiate with each actor individually and try and find some deal and then sell it to each of the participants. I think he's going to face a very high bar in doing so with Vladimir, Z- Vladimir Zelensky especially because any sort of ceasefire negotiation at this point would require some major concessions from Ukraine that, put simply, they don't look like they're ready to give up. And Trump doesn't seem like he has the leverage to force them to either. In any case, Trump will reduce U.S. military and financial support for Ukraine, leaving them in a more difficult position and putting more of that burden onto U.S. European ally, the U.S.'s European allies who would be forced to fill that vacuum. 
arguments for supporting Ukraine continue to be if Russia takes Ukraine, Russia simply won't stop there. They'll steamroll through Ukraine and go um, through Europe. So what does Trump's involvement in this Russia-Ukraine war, the negotiations, mean for the rest of Europe? Well, it means, you know, again, that the U.S. will be playing a less active role potentially in guaranteeing European security. It means also that Trump's interest in a ceasefire, even one that's not politically supported by Kiev and that doesn't have the type of long term security commitments, defense agreements and other things that would make it durable, suggests that Europe faces a more uncertain future. It faces uh, a potentially antagonistic uh, Russia, an opportunistic Russia at the very least, with less U.S. backing. So I think it spurs Europeans to take a more individual approach to guaranteeing their own security, reinvesting in defense manufacturing, defense production, uh, military expansion, when previously those hadn't been necessarily top list priorities. I do now want to move on to the Middle East. After Donald Trump was declared the winner, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu released a statement about Trump returning to the White House, and he sounded pretty ecstatic for the relationship and the continued partnership between Israel and the United States. What does that partnership look like once Trump retakes the White House? It looks like a lot less critical of a relationship or a lot less skeptical of a relationship than the one we saw between Biden and Netanyahu at any level. A U.S. president doesn't have that much leverage, really, to shift Israeli policymaking. U.S. defense defense commitments to Israel are largely untouchable. Look at Biden. You know, he was frustrated with Israel's approach to Gaza, threatened to cut off arms supplies. At the end of the day, they delayed delivery of a few dozen JDAMs. But the core of U.S. military support to Israel continued unbroken. That really reflects the reality of the situation. U.S. presidents, if they're skeptical of Israel, can make public statements but can't do much to really change things behind the scene. Trump won't even make the public statements. He's His view is Israel's business is Israel's business. As long as the crisis, the conflict in Gaza, the conflict in the north of Israel and Lebanon, as long as those things are on a pathway to some resolution or at least some stasis before or soon after Trump takes office, that matches the entirety of his, his desires. Israel's involved in multiple conflicts between Hamas in Gaza as well as Hamas or um, Hezbollah in Lebanon. And Donald Trump has vowed to bring peace to the Middle East. So how exactly do you think he can do that? Will he do that? And what exactly does that look like? So I think we know exactly what it looks like. It looks like the Abraham Accords that Trump pursued in his first administration. It looks like tripartite negotiations between Israel, Saudi Arabia and the U.S. aimed at both normalizing relations between the Gulf states and Israel, as well as establishing or codifying the defense relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. That can't happen until you see the crisis in Gaza, the crisis in Lebanon recede. Uh, that means that a, a, tri a, a trilateral deal is probably not in the cards in the near or inter intermediate future. That said, a bilateral deal between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia that stops short of the treaty-level defense security obligations that Saudi Arabia is seeking Seems like something Trump will probably push for early in his next administration. I think that's what Trump means when he talks about bringing peace to the Middle East. He, everything is framed through this sort of trilateral deal that, in his view, re leads to regional stability. I do now want to finally turn to China. In his first term, Donald Trump engaged in a tit-for-tat trade war with China, and he imposed steep tariffs. In his second term, is that going to continue? What does our relationship with China look like? relationship with China looks more antagonistic. Trump will pursue an aggressive trade policy. That's been a key feature of his campaign. We know that it's a key feature of his, his policymaking agenda. It's a key goal of one of his most important uh, advisors, Robert Lighthizer, who's almost guaranteed to come back in a second administration. So tariffs are going up. The Chinese response function at this point, a little uncertain, uh, but it would, would likely entail some level of retaliation. We're not quite sure what that looks like just yet. Combined with that, Trump will also have much less focus on maintaining the di diplomatic guardrails that we currently see around the relationship. You know, one part of that's functional. Different people at the State Department, national, the NSC and the Defense Department mean that you won't have the deep relationships or the relationships to maintain ties like the one between Jake Sullivan and Wang Yi. But more, more importantly, Trump's not going to dedicate the resources to rebuilding those relationships that you might have expected under a Democratic administration. He's more comfortable with a more antagonistic relationship with China. And 
how important are those relationships when he's only going to be a one term or this will be his last term as president so it would only be four years how important are those relationships for the next four years crucially I mean, look, Biden was only president for four years, and you saw a tremendous amount of effort put into building diplomatic relations, rebuilding diplomatic relations towards the end of that four year cycle. Any administration changes over in personnel, usually, even if the president holds on to two different terms. So it's vitally important the relationships that Trump's advisors either build or don't rebuild with some of America's key competitors and allies. And long term, let's say a Democrat wins in four years. Are those relationships broken for good? How long does it take to repair? What does that look like usually? So you're really kind of approaching this from a binary perspective. I'm not sure that's the the best way to think about it. Each administration dictates and manages foreign policy for the time that they're in office. Leaving office does not completely eliminate, obviously, the relationships that exist the interactions that exist that have been codified through cabinet level engagements and things of that nature. So I don't think that it's correct to view each administration as maybe fully isolated from the one that preceded it. The point that we're making about the transition to Trump is that the things that currently define the U.S.-China relationship will shift fundamentally. It doesn't mean that the U.S. and China, Chinese governments won't talk to each other. They still will. But the personal relationships that were in, in, integral to the Biden administration will necessarily go away you'll have a different approach with regards to security and trade policy. These create additional stresses on those relationships, and it makes it harder for the U.S. and China to maintain the current balance, the current stability in what is, in fact, a declining and increasingly competitive relationship. And Donald Trump has said before that China wouldn't invade Taiwan if he were president. Do you think that's the case? Do you think him uh, going back to the White House is enough of a deterrent for China? I don't really have a good answer to that question. I think Trump's statement is in line with many of the other things that he says, that all the bad things that people fear, they wouldn't happen if I was president. That's a pretty simplistic appeal. It's a pretty core appeal for any politician. Things would be better if I was in charge. Trump specifically has made somewhat contradictory statements about U.S. policy towards Taiwan, claiming or noting that US is, the U.S.'s willingness to defend Taiwan militarily is likely linked in Trump's worldview to the economic benefit that results. That suggests that there's a world where that economic benefit is small enough to justify potentially moving away from defending Taiwan. So I don't know that there's a cohesive or coherent worldview that points out that invasion of Taiwan is you know, not going to happen under Trump. I think it will depend largely on what red lines Trump chooses to draw in different aspects of the U.S.-China military balance of power. I think your point of not looking at this through a binary lens is really important. and. Leading up to the election, people have said a presidency, a Trump presidency versus a Harris presidency is night and day. But when it comes to the world stage, when it comes to foreign policy, do you think it's night and day? Do you think the um, Biden leaving office, Trump becoming president once again, do you think that is an America that is vastly different from the one we've had the past four years? I think it's going to be vastly different in a number of areas. I don't think that it's going to be night and day across everything. <clears throat> I think that it will change the way that the U.S. approaches the balance of power between federal and state entities. I think that it will change the way that the U.S. interacts with the rest of the world. I think that it will change the role that the federal government sees for itself in regulatory authority uh, and other items that really define the Biden administration's approach. I think you'll also see a shift in the way that the federal government views its role in setting industrial policy. You know, the expansion of clean energy manufacturing investments is probably not top of mind, not top of the list for a Republican dominated Congress. So I think that there will be major aspects of U.S. life that change substantially, but I don't know that you would expect it to be a night and day difference. It won't be a completely new world. Well, Clayton Allen, per usual, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate your perspective. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me.